After many years of wanting to visit New Zealand, I was finally on a train to Heathrow Airport for the trip of a lifetime. There's my flight, somewhere up there, and all running to time. On to British Airways to Hong Kong, and then Cathay Pacific to Auckland. I'd rather splendidly managed to bag one of the front seats with loads of extra legroom too. Arriving at Auckland, my hotel room wasn't ready, so I left my bags and wandered down to the harbour. It was fantastic weather, quite the change after wet and windy England. I'd been warned central Auckland is a hubbub of building work, and no kidding. Apparently they're putting in the city's first underground train line, right underneath everything that's already there. Everywhere you looked, roads were shut and construction was underway. Plus, there was all the normal city building works as well. So I took myself away from the noise to the Domain, a large park in the Grafton area of the city. People were playing cricket. It was very civilised. And at the top of the park, by a museum, you get a decent view back over the city and harbour. The water was just too inviting. A boat trip beckoned, a guided journey around the harbour seeing the sights. This wooden lighthouse at Bean Rock is the oldest in New Zealand, built in 1870 and originally using a kerosene lamp, but now running on solar power. I went for a little chat with the boat captain and told him about life on the narrowboat, whether he wanted to hear about it or not. Auckland is known as the City of Sails, and when you see all the boats, you understand why. That's Auckland Harbour Bridge, carrying eight lanes of traffic. It originally had four lanes, then they bolted on two extra ones on each side, propped up with cantilevers from the piers. And at the far end of the harbour, a sugar factory built in 1884, the main source of sugar in New Zealand. Coming back under the harbour bridge, and we spotted some intrepid folk up top, bungee jumping. You wouldn't catch me doing that. A closer look at the massive marina at West Haven with over 2,000 boats, and it's going to get bigger. This coal-fired steam tug played a key role in saving the harbour bridge from damage in a storm while it was under construction. The tug is now maintained by enthusiasts. Just before we ended the tour, a stop at some apartments and hotel buildings built to resemble the cruise ships that come into dock alongside, and the captain helpfully stopped just here for the shot of the Auckland Sky Tower between the buildings. What a busy day. Time for a snooze. There's no better view of Auckland than you get from the top of Mount Eden. A bit of a steep and slow walk, but definitely worth it. I hate doing panning shots generally, as you can't really take anything in, and they are a bit vomit-inducing to watch, but there really is no other way to capture just how much of everything you can see from up there. I could happily have sat here for hours. I wish I'd taken a picnic. It was quite busy though, a popular spot for obvious reasons. Before I picked up my camper van, a meet-up with some lovely viewers. The place we'd chosen turned out to be shut, so we had to move, with huge apologies if you missed us. And so to my chariot for the next couple of weeks, a 2006 Honda Mobilio people carrier converted to a micro camper van for one. 
You can just see there the single bed stretched out from the passenger seat backwards. It's petrol engined with a shrieking high revving 1.5 litre engine. A sports car this is not, but it managed everything I threw at it. Inside, excuse the banana, there's the bed. Long enough and just about wide enough for one, it was all right once I got used to it. The linen is provided by the hire company. The bed stays permanently set up like that. Next to it, one of the original rear seats, which I never actually sat in but used for storage. There is a table you can put up if you're sat there, which has a leg that slots into that hole in the bed frame. I mostly just sat at the end of the bed and didn't bother with the table as it was stored underneath the bed and was a pain to get out. The van is certified self-contained, which means it has a portable toilet usable within the van. By odd coincidence, it's exactly the same one I have in my own camper van. I never used it though, there were loads of toilets around as I travelled. A blanket I used as an extra pillow. It was plenty warm enough. And there's space under the bed for my bag, though this really needed a strap to hold it in place while driving. A small electrics panel turns on the fridge, interior lights, water pump and stereo. Yes, the van even has a tiny fridge. You may be wondering not only where that is, but the rest of the kitchen too. Well, this is very much an alfresco design of camper van when it comes to mealtime. Open up the back and there it all is. Let's take a look. That is the fridge, a 12 volt compressor unit with a little cupboard for food next to it. You can get a surprising amount in that drawer, but rather less in the fridge, which I should have checked before doing my first chop as I bought a huge carton of milk plus a massive wadge of cheese and nearly couldn't fit it all in. The milk of course then leaked and it was all a bit of a disaster. Above that a small drawer houses the cutlery plus salt, pepper and some cooking oil and the little stick that lights the gas stove. Pots and pans, a kettle, chopping board and tea towels are here though it really needed a proper china mug for tea, I think. The stainless steel one just wasn't up to the job. And there's a small sink up top which drains to a grey water tank. It's got a cold water feed from this shower head fed by an electric pump. I mentioned a gas stove. Well, that yellow thing is it. You take it out and open it up and it's got two burners and it sits on the door of the pots and pans cupboard supported by the door to the gas bottle. That gas bottle is underneath. Tiny little thing, but plenty for some cups of tea and basic cooking. I used so little gas that it was still seen as full by the refuelling station later on. Also down here, behind the artfully placed loaf of bread, is a dustpan and brush, plus the outlet hose from the grey water tank, so you can dump when it's full, plus a spare tyre and a kit to fit it as well. At the back of the van on the side, the water filling point not to be confused with the petrol filling point immediately below. And then if you open the passenger door underneath the bed, not only is there a towel which they provide, but also some rather basic curtains which you stick around the van on pop studs. They weren't that great really, but just about did the job. There's one of the studs on that front window. Also in here, in the glove box, are some cloths to mop up morning condensation from the windows and I was very pleased to see they include a mobile phone holder, so I was able to use the phone as a sat-nav, which worked very well with Google Maps. Also, note the car is an automatic, very easy to drive. And that is the van tour. In the next episode, I head off to the Covey Insurance Motorhome Caravan and Outdoor Show in Auckland. Cheerio.